Hi everyone and welcome to the Book Refuge and welcome to the start of my Droughtlander content. Um, I'm going to try to at least once a, month, once a month to twice a month have some kind of Outlander content for you. In this beginning part where we're all suffering right now, there'll probably be more than normal um, just because everybody is craving that, people are needing their fix, and I'm here to deliver. Jen from the Book Refuge reporting for duty. So today the video I'm bringing you, which I'm sure you already know, is the best slash worst changes from the book. I'll tell you right now, I don't have a ton of best, but I thought that was like a good title for it. Um, really what I'm going to do is I came up with kind of like nine different points and I'm gonna start with the ones that I like, like the most and then work up to basically the top three on my list are the ones that anger me the most. And you're gonna see feisty Jen come out, you know, don't you just love her? <laughs> but I'm gonna start with some that I like slash I'm kind of benign about them and build towards the ones that really frustrate me. But some of the points, because I, this is kind of done by character just because like character and relationships are the things that were most important to me about if they got messed up. Whereas like timeline slash events, yes, we're going to talk about those, but that's something where I understand the writers messing around kind of with time. But I don't like when they mess around with who the essential characters are, what their base personalities slash traits are. That's something that really frustrates me. And then when we just see flashes of that character, it makes me even more upset because I'm like, oh, see, Sam knows. Sam knows what this scene is about and he's bringing it. And all these other times you have him do it differently, it bothers me. So anyway, um, let's dive into this, starting with the one that I straight up will just call a good. And that is Marcelie and Fergus Fraser. I adored these two from the moment that they were introduced in season three. So the adult versions of them. Anyway, I did really love young Fergus as well. I thought he was magnifique. He was amazing. He was so charming and you could totally tell how he won Jamie over even as he um, was stealing his purse. And the things that he went through. I just thought that young actor did so, so good. He was brilliant. And Marcely, she is just even more than I could ever imagine. Like, honest to goodness. I love the actress who plays her. I love how brash and bold and amazing she is. I feel like she gives me the spirit of the Marcely I want. And they just keep giving her stuff to do. Um, and I adore that because Marcely, she's a character I greatly admire in the books. I think she goes through a lot. I think things are a lot tougher for her and Fergus in the book than they've been yet so far in the show. We'll see though. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. The show is not over yet. And I just love the things we've got from her especially in season five with her being Claire's apprentice and with her being there for Brie and Ian. She's just like there to offer advice kind of for everyone and I love that. I think we it gets forgotten in the show that well I don't know how young they really made her in the show but in the book she's 15 years old and decides that Fergus is her man and she will not let anyone take her away. I think we could maybe say her 18 in the TV show. I think we could buy that. And even then, that would make her only about like 23, 24 right now in the show. And I just love, I love her. She's amazing. So her and Fergus together, they're so adorable. I loved, um, her having the baby in the woods and her literally being pregnant three different times in three, like two different times in season uh, five, which is totally true. They have babies all the time. But so anyway, that is a change that I don't have anything bad to say, even with her being the one to kill Lionel Brown in the current season. 
I'm okay with that. I thought it was very powerful her doing it. And so I don't really have a problem with that other than I don't know where we're going with some of the threads, which is going to get brought up soon. But in regards to the actors who play them and how their characters differ from the book to the movie or to the show, I really like it. I'm interested to see if they do bring in some more of the dark sides of Fergus going forward. If they do the, the, um, Henry Christian storyline, I would be interested to see that because this Fergus that, this Fergus that we have in the show, he's so humble and loving and accepting of his disability, or I mean his like, I don't know, handicapped disability, whatever we want to call it, his missing hand, like how he is with, you know, how they have him talk to um, young Ian about Jamie wanting his leg cut off and that they would, you know, still love him if if Jamie was upset about that, like, of course, you're still upset about losing that. So I foresee them, if Henry Christian, if they do the Henry Christian storyline, I actually foresee maybe Marcelli blaming herself rather than Fergus for killing Lionel Brown and for maybe like her fall or something. Like I can see her blaming herself more than Fergus. So that would be interesting. I don't want any story taken away from Fergus, but to see Lauren Lyle do that, I feel like she could be a really good at like taking that guilt. It would be amazing. Okay, time to move on. The next thing up the story, I just have it bunched together with store with timeline is literally what I have written. Um, and I listed a few things for this. So I'm torn about this mostly because I feel like for season five, they wanted to put more exciting things in that book instead of dealing with kind of like the soap opera on the ridge, which is really what books, I mean, Alamance is only in the first half of that book. And then it's a lot of drama back at home. It's dealing with the repercussions of Alamance. It's dealing with Jamie's leg. It's dealing with new people coming to live. It's dealing with, um, Stephen Bonnet. So there's a lot of like soap opery stuff that happened and, they brought forward quite a few events. They had the weird fake out with Brie and Roger leaving. It was just a mess. So I lumped kind of a lot of things into it. We brought Ian back early. We have um, Lord John coming to the ridge like all the freaking time instead of it being letters, which I know is to, you know, again, I know the practicalities of like shooting is one thing and the other thing is I'm talking about the changes and so I have to mention that even if I understand the reasoning for there being changes, right? So that's just kind of what I'm just mentioning is like I am stating I think the timeline is whacked out, especially because we had super big events of season five and then or book five and you brought stuff from book six back in time. And then, what are we doing? Not sure. So next, I want to move along to Stephen Bonnet. And he's actually lower on the list than I thought he would be. And the reason for this being, Stephen Bonnet haunts us for about three books. He is just something that we don't think about all the time. But through books four, five, and six, he's something that just haunts us. And at different times, we'll hear a mention of him. He is like just a criminal mas mastermind slash overlord because if anything shady is happening in their area, Stephen Bonnet's name's come with them. The Irishman, the smuggler, the pirate, his name comes up in the books all the time. We have two major confrontations with him. We have the one at the end of book five where he tries to kidnap Brie and she shoots him in the balls and they get away. And then the confrontation at the end of book six, where he kidnaps her, tries to sell her as a slave, ends up getting caught and um, sentenced to death by drowning and Brie kills him and leaves. Those are the things. And the show kind of mashed them together because I foresee, I understand that they didn't want to drag this conflict out. But to me, it's important that basically Brie and Roger have come to terms with him by the point we have to confront him again. We are reasonably sure that Jemmy is Roger's. We 
don't he doesn't really affect our lives when we are out on the ridge because he's never going to come there and but he still is like a phantom that comes up once in a while and he's something that still causes dree bree bad dreams now and then and it's some he's someone that Jamie and Roger and Claire all feel very guilty that he ever got his hands on Bree and any part that they played in that happening and I just feel like I just feel like there was never a chance of us to get over him until we were fighting him. And I really appreciate that about Brie, that she has her journals that she writes about him. She has her art that she does. She has her engineering. She's such a strong, complete woman. And this assault, like, didn't keep her down. And I feel like the show kind of has that happen. And I know that that may seem the quote-unquote classic way to show um, assault trauma but I don't really appreciate it because I appreciate that in the Outlander series the books we see many different people be raped we do and each of them deals with it differently and I really appreciate how Brie deals with it and I appreciate that she blamed herself and then needs that to be shown to her that it wasn't her fault and that no matter that she is a tall, strong, powerful woman, she's still lesser than a man who's trying to hurt her. She's not lesser than a man for her worth, but when you come face to face with a strong, angry man who wants to assault you, the best thing you can do sometimes is to live and that's what she does and she's ashamed with herself that she did that and, you know, Jamie takes the opportunity to prove it. And now I'm getting into Brie instead. Sorry, I have more to say about Brie. But my point being, I feel like Steven, we made him kind of the big point of season five. We showed his back end dealings. We had him trying to become Jem's father, which I really didn't approve. Although some of the things I was saying about it, I now understand it more fully because I rewatched the last half of the season again. Because I didn't understand how he thought he was going to just, just because he would have himself declared legally Jem's father, how he would get control of River Run, since, you know, there's other people in charge of it. Jem's only a baby. But I rewatched it and realized that, well, the plan was he would get named guardian of him and then kill off Joe Costa and Duncan, and then he would be in charge of the fortune. So I missed that part. Pardon me. But because we don't have the Frenchman Golden play, which that is much higher on this list because we don't have the Frenchman's gold in play we had to come up with another reason for him and the idea that he is trying to become a better man either deluding himself into that or actually wanting to try it just doesn't sit well with me the Stephen Bonnet of the books pretends to be nothing other than he is he's a bastard he's an asshole he's a pirate he's a smuggler he doesn't have anything like he doesn't have anything else he's trying to be even when he kidnaps Bree and he you know is going to rape her just because Leroy needs some attention oh my God. he nicknames his dick Leroy just so you know Leroy needs a gallop is what he says in the book dear god dear god and I love that he was just like oh you're pregnant yeah I don't want to hurt you I just want to get some so he moves along, which is so much different than the Steven we see in the show who does those things out of sadisticness, like out of sadism, where he's like, oh, you like, I'll show you how good I am. He doesn't sleep with the, he sleeps with that whore to hurt her, show her how good she's getting it. Sorry, I keep doing this, but it, it bothers me because it's like, not only, yes, it's giving her flashbacks to it happening to her, but he was never, like, that violent with her. That's what's scary. Because that's what happened to her, is that she froze when he was raping her the first time. And although he did, like, tell her not to throw a fit, but there was nowhere she could go. Because it happened to her on his boat. She was getting, she had paid for passage on his boat. And, you know, to get that ring back, that's just what he thought he was owed. And she froze. So it wasn't a violent assault, 
but it was still just as horrible as that can possibly be. But so for in the show to be like, oh, he's showing her how good it could be. No, that's not why he slept with a whore. He slept with a whore because he needed release and he was kind of being respectful of Brie. This doesn't make him a good man. He's still going to sell her to slavery. But the point is, he doesn't pretend to be something other than he is. He's like, I kidnapped you. I am going to sell you. But I'm not going to be a dick about it until he is a dick about it and let somebody feel her up and all the things. So anyway, my point being, I don't like what his goals were in the show. I don't like that they tried to make him a like sadistic, twistic, like mind fuck when I think he just, he wants money. He does what he can to get money. That's all that he's motivated by. And I feel like in the show, they try to make it seem like he's motivated by other things. Sure, that could be him just trying to delude himself into that he's doing it for a greater reason. But the Stephen Bonnet that I know, he's in it for money. And everything he does, he will take the best offer that's there. And so if he can't get the Frenchman's gold out of Brie, he will get some gold out of her by selling her. And he's not selling her for, you know, just because he's mad at her. That's just what his plan is. And he's not, he's not a great person, but whatever. So that's just some issues that I have. The good, again, I feel like Ed Spleers is amazing. And for the character they're having him portray, I do believe that he would snap at any moment. And he does a few times. He's creepy. All right, next, we got to talk about Myrta. And this hurts me. It hurts me. Because I feel like Duncan played Myrta so well. And it's funny because I... I was so excited in season three when, like, he was there. And in season four, when we got to see him, I was so happy. Because I, I love him. But... There's a thing about Murta died a hero at Culloden with all the others who did. And I believe that like Dougal, Murta's spirit watches over Jamie. And he's someone that Jamie thinks of often and someone who, you know, always was there to protect him and have his back when the Mackenzies didn't. Um, Dougal had a vow and he took care of his godson as best he could. And though I love the man who plays him, I really don't like that they kept him around, made him the head of the regulators, showed him tar and feathering people, showed him you know, riling the people up and eventually then dying at Alamance as, you know, yes, it's a, it's a warrior's death. He dies protecting Jamie, but that's not where it was supposed to happen. And now what he's to, he's buried in not the country of his homeland, where if he had, you know, passed on Clawden Field, he would be in Scotland and his body would rest there where it belongs at home. And I just didn't like that we had to have this storyline with Myrta. And I know they wanted someone on that side that we could care about. Again, I can acknowledge the show's reasonings. Being having a wonderful actor. Being like a great storytelling point. But I don't agree with it in that way. Because honestly, the regulators, there's historical figures we could have leaned on. Um, we could have made it less of a thing, which... In the, in the books, the main thing about Alamance is that it all doesn't last very long, but there are a lot of consequences from it, which I feel like we could have focused on. But show wants to have a big battle. Hurrah, hurrah, it happened. I'm just saying I don't really like it. Also, the relationship with Jocasta, which again, made me a little swoony. I love seeing older couples get the love. But it messes up a lot of things. And I think it messes up a lot of things even within the show itself by having Ulysses still have a love for Jocasta. And he's bringing her to these meetups with Myrta. And it just doesn't sit right with me because the Jocasta in the books, she's actually very faithful to Ulysses. And when she marries Duncan, Duncan um, 
has trouble performing and so they are just friends and Ulysses and Jocasta are able to still have their relationship and in the show to make him have a one-sided infatuation with her I'm not a big fan of this at all and but we can't have her love both Murtaugh and Ulysses so it becomes more of like they've just been companions all this time they're friends which is fine for that side but I don't like Murtaugh and Jocasta having a thing because it just tangles up so much and there was other stories that could have been told with Jocasta. They could have got a really awesome Duncan Ennis character. A character who's around for a lot. And he has a lot of drama on his own. And I get a lot of stuff at River Run can get really sticky. Because in books 4, 5, and 6, there's a lot of inappropriate things happening with the slaves there. And with relationships happening and secrets and murders and I understand not wanting to like dive into that like we tried that at the beginning of season four and it didn't work well so let's back away slowly but because the people doing the murdering weren't actually any of the servants I think we still should have had the murders that happened there and the culprits who really did it start setting up that storyline so that's enough with Murta and Jocasta. Let's move along to Galus Duncan. This is going back just a little ways. And this is the last one that's like not as big of a deal to me. So I want to kind of get through it because at the end of the day, the stuff with Galus is now done and it's totally fine. However, they went about it. Like, it's cool. I really loved the actress who played Galus. She's awesome. But they made Galus's return pretty crazy. They made her still super beautiful. They made her bathe in pig's blood. They had her being super seductive and just this like evil seductress. And I'm not a fan of that. I like when she comes back and Claire doesn't even recognize her because she's gotten fat and ugly. She has syphilis. She has been raping young boys and she is a psychopath. She's a psychopath. And just her whole interactions, like she is really horrible to um, one of her slaves who's like, um, is sick and Claire tries to take care of her and Galus is just like, eh, I don't care. And she's just a horrible, disgusting woman. And we went this like weird, seductive, creepy way with her. And again, it comes back to the actress who plays her. Like nobody wanted to put Lottie Verbeek in a fat suit or have her be this like disgusting predator but like but she is and the point with Galus is like now the outside matches the inside and her time being the mistress of this place she's been killing husbands one by one and taking their money is that her outside finally looked like her insides and that's something that I really appreciated about Galus is this was someone who she's a murderer she murders all her husbands and she's a rapist she is a just she is a witch in my opinion like she wants to be a witch that's what she's going for and I just I hate her and I don't like that we made her so like likable and I know she's not likable because she still does bad things but I just I just really didn't like what we did with her I love her in the first season and I think that that is the gay list I like that but I wish that when we'd met her like we almost didn't recognize her anymore and she's so desperate to like go back and almost like try again and finally fulfill the prophecy and oh that whole thing like with the sapphires and Lord John and with that and the Campbells and I just I hated it so much I hated it so much except the last 20 minutes of that show were fine how it ended that episode but no next we have Brianna Randall Frazier. I, for the most part, this is something I have to say about a couple other characters as well. I'm just not a fan of her attitude a lot of times. And I know a lot of people don't like her in the books anyway, so they like that she wasn't super likable. But see, I see it differently. So Brianna, she's not super likable in the first, in the second and third book. The, this 
20 year old has had her entire life turned upside down. The father that she loved, who she's grieving for, she finds out that her mother cheated on him. That's how it looks to her. And that her mother lived this fantasy life. And that Brie is the product of that. And that, <coughs> that is a hard thing to come to terms with. Also, her beginning relationship with Roger. I, they have so many conversations. Um, they do the long distance thing back and forth for a couple years, I think it is. Yeah, it's a couple years. And she's trying to come to terms with the knowledge that she's possibly a time traveler, um, finding out what's happening to her mother and Jamie, grieving for her mother, wanting to be with Roger, but wanting to make sure that he really is the one for her and that she won't get pulled away from him. Roger sticking to his convictions with her and saying that like, Roger in the books is super sexy to me. A lot of people don't like that. But to me, he is because he sticks by his convictions and he's found this woman that he loves so much, but he's not going to take the easy way out. He doesn't just want short time thrills with her. And Brie is like upset about that, but she also understands it and respects it. And when she leaves him here, it isn't because they had a fight. It's because he knows he she needs an anchor, someone to come home to. And so if she goes to the past, visits her parents, l warns them about what's going to happen, she wants someone to come back to. It's because she loves him more than anyone else that she leaves him. And because he's the only thing that could bring her back. And so when he comes back as well, she's so angry because she's like, now how are we ever going to get home? Because both of us are here and there's nothing that we love in the future so much that we'll be able to go back to it. And they just have a little bit of a different dynamic because Roger is a lot more forceful with her and she's forceful back and they like that. Like it's, it sparks together. It's beautiful. And also, she starts inventing things right away. She isn't nervous about changing the future. She wants to make the ridge as progressive and home-like as it can be. She's working on making um, plumbing. She helps make the syringes. She works on bricks. She's trying to, like, brick make bricks to help with things. She is always coming up with projects. Lord John is always sending her different things. She makes matches. She makes... Um, Oh, she just helps with so many things. She helps with different medical devices her mother needs. She doesn't need to be convinced to use her engineering or decide that it is the dream for her. And I really hope in the next season, now that they've decided to stay, that that's where we go with things because it really like grates on me that she got after Claire for trying to create penicillin. Like, why wouldn't you want her to? What if your kid needs that penicillin? You want her to make it. You just don't want her to like tell everyone about it. And so there's just little things that I feel like they make Brie kind of naggy. Um, I really am not a huge fan either of when Roger is struggling with losing his voice. Yes, she wants him to move on from it. She talks with her mother about it. She talks with her father about it. Jamie gives her some wonderful advice that, like, he's trying to figure out how he can still provide for you and who he is as a man when he's lost his most important gift. And that's a hard thing for the man because he felt like he could offer you one thing. He knew the life he could offer you. Not only is he already struggling being in the past where he doesn't fit in, but now he lost the thing that did make him fit in back here. Like, being a bard, being a singer is very important in the Scottish culture. And for him to lose that... Now he doesn't know who he is. And Brie, she is so worried that she's never going to hear him say her name again. And when he comes back and says her name and is like, I'm here now, like, we're going to do this. She just knows that everything's going to be okay. And I love that. So there's other things about Brie, but we'll move along. But that's something that really just bothers me because I see parts of the breed that I love but a lot of times she's just too she's too soft for me all the time um the breed from the books is a badass like she is a badass and I want to see more of that happen
I really want to see more of that because Brie from the books this time around, she's my favorite character other than Damien Claire. I love her. She's amazing. All right, let's talk about the Frenchman's Gold, which I'm not a fan of this storyline in the books. I will tell you, this damn French gold that's meant to be for Charles Stewart, but gets waylaid and then gets taken by, uh, a portion of it gets taken by Jocasta and her husband, and it's been hidden away in her crypt. And there is another member of that party who divided the gold that is coming after it. And she can't see anymore. She used to be able to see back then. So she knows who the other people involved are. But she didn't know his name. But she knew what he looked like. And we have Stephen Bonnet learns of it and tries to find it. We have that other person trying to find it. We have um, murders happen over it. We have Daniel Rawlings was killed because of it. We have the huge epic blowout at the end of... Uh, book six, where the house burns down, the gold is hidden under the white sow down there, and Merdina Bug ends up getting killed. Arch makes his vow to come after, to come after Ian. Um, and I'll stop there. There are still threads of the gold happening in books seven and eight, but that's stuff that happens through six. So I don't know if they will bring this back again. I don't know if the show felt like we book readers felt that it carries on forever. But I, the way that I've reconciled myself to it is this. This is a buried treasure. This is a treasure that we know exists and is tangible and real. And the people that know about it, they're going to want to find it because it's a lot of money. That is a thing that will carry on for years and years and years and continue to be a thing. So even though whenever the gold gets brought up in the books, I'm like, oh God, the gold again. Yes, the gold again, because it's a lot of money and people want it. So even though that's a storyline that can get tiresome, if there was really hundreds of thousands of dollars in gold and, um, you know, other treasures and you knew about it, you would be trying to find it. So to take that out and we haven't had anything to do with it really since Galus is kind of annoying to me. So I would really like us to do something with it again. I would like there to be something about like the Daniel Rawlings get brought back up again and the story with it at River Run that it's stored in one of the crypts there. Like I would like us to do something with that because the Frenchman's Gold is a really crucial part to book seven at least with things happening with Bree and Roger. And yes, I would just, it bothers me that we haven't had mention of it in like two seasons. And it's something that gets brought up pretty regularly in the books because it's important. And Stephen Bonnet was the perfect time for that. And we went a different way with him. Okay, so two more things that I have left to talk about. And it's hard for me to decide which one is worse, but I think that I know in my heart which one's worse. So we'll go with the second to worst. The second to worst book to a uh, film change that I have is Frank Randall. I hate Frank Randall. I have no sympathy for him at the point in rereads that I've been through. The only tiny sliver of ever any care I had for him died at the end of book four. And I understand obviously Claire would still think of her husband sometimes and I understand that Bree still has fond memories of her father and I have a little bit of fondness for him in you know Bree having good memories of him and that he was a good father to Jamie's daughter I will give him that but I don't like Frank and what I really didn't like about the show is I understand that making him sympathetic in season one and in season two, a little bit. I understand. But what I don't like is that because we had Tobias Menzies, who is a god among actors, I understand. He's wonderful. I don't know if you watched The Crown yet. He plays Prince Philip in season three, and he's amazing. However, I don't like how much sympathy we're supposed to have for him in season three, where he, you know, has just been 
in love with his mistress all this time but staying with Claire for Brie and then is gonna take Brie away just floors me and the Frank in the books he was pretty conniving he found out like everything that happened with Jamie he even finds hints that she may go back as well and he hides it and he hides it dirty he hides it dirty and he knows Claire will be faithful and never bring up Jamie or you know try to leave him and he still hides it because he's a coward and I just don't like him he's racist he is just cruel and the things he says sometimes he's just not a great he's just not a great person he's a great dad in a lot of respects but not being honest with your daughter ever is that is that a great dad that you don't trust her love for you enough you know maybe she would have liked to have conversations with you about it maybe you could have explained your side of it um because claire is far more fair to frank than i think he deserves and i just ooh, so i think jamie understands frank pretty well though and there are a few different times in the books where I like things that Jamie says. Like one of my favorites is when he says to Claire um, at the end of book four, Roger had read a letter proving that Frank knew and Roger shares that with Jamie and then shares it with Brie and Claire. And Jamie tells Claire, he's like, I'm a selfish man, Sassanak, and I would keep you from him but I won't keep him from you. And so he wants her to remember her husband fondly as long as she still loves him best. And I wouldn't even mind that. Like, I would like to see that side of Jamie, like acknowledging that Frank wasn't always perfect, but like he took care, Jamie trusted Frank with his most precious possessions, Claire and Brianna. And I wish that Frank would acknowledge it back that thank you for sending her back to me because if Jamie had not made her, Claire would have died at Culloden with him. She would have, or she would have been there and suffered through everything with him. And she probably would have died in childbirth with Brianna. And I wish that, this is me wishing that from like book Frank's point of view, because I feel like he never does acknowledge Jamie the same way Jamie acknowledges him. So I really, really don't like those changes. I wish that we'd kept him just a little more spiteful, that we would see more of the conniving that he did, and that he actively kept his family with him, only to be ready to cast Claire aside. Like, it's the cruel, it's the it's so cruel. It's so cruel to me. I understand him wanting to keep his daughter, and if he would have explained things to her, I feel like she would have picked him. He could have even done it that way. But to choose to keep Claire from Jamie or the knowledge that he had, like, I don't know. It bugs me. I know there's arguments all the way around this, um, but I don't like how the show did it. They're just, they're always on the Frank team. They're always on the Frank team and I'm not team Frank. So anyway, all right. And now the number one thing that I hate the most about the changes from the book to the TV show, and I bet you guys can guess it because I talk about it almost every episode of season five, and that is the Roger and Jamie relationship. This stabs me right in the soul, guys. It hits me, it hits me hard, and it hurts. That, the building of that relationship, with, which starts in truth when Roger comes back, when he chooses to come back, Jamie tells him, you are still hand fast with my daughter and you are until such and such a date. You will not force yourself on her, but you're going to live as husband and wife. And at the end of this, you can decide if you still want to be together. Sorry, light beams. And when Roger chooses to stay, when he's made that choice to come back, they start building their relationship. Because the thing about Jamie Fraser from the books is that he gives every man a fair shake. He gives every man a fair shake until they prove otherwise. And while he was thinking badly of Roger, because, you know, he'd slept with his daughter and then abandoned her and, you know, 
all the all the things that led up to that when Roger chooses to come home when he chooses to marry his daughter he becomes the son of his blood and through book five of them interacting in the militia together of Roger becoming you know injured in service of him Jamie tells Tryon you hung my son and he claims Roger as his son in front of the governor and demands like recompense for it and it's so beautiful and we just watch that relationship grow when Jamie is hurt and him and Roger are bonding when he's helping him train to fight um Bonnet when he sees that Roger wants to kill this man for what he's done to his daughter and he says she's your daughter but she's my wife and the right is mine and Jamie teaches him and guides him he's a father to him and Roger has had a father but not like this and not anymore and to have a true like Scottish father um da to teach him these things to teach him things that he never thought he would need to know. Um, and also, Jamie likes that Roger's a teacher. Jamie's a learned man. They have fascinating conversations about philosophy and history and things that will happen. And I feel like Jamie in the show is always kind of like rolling his eyes that Roger's a teacher and not a farmer or a hunter. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't like, he wants him to be better at those things, but he never like disparages him because he doesn't know them. Jamie is a fair person. And the fact that he sees that Roger's the first one to jump into anything, he's ready to dig <laughs> pits, he's ready to build fences, he's ready to do whatever is needed. Jamie respects that and their relationship blooms into one of my favorite like bromances slash father-son relationships ever. When... Um, Jamie is hurt and Roger's doing everything he can to get him home to Claire. Roger is desperate to do it. He loves this man and that's when it really sinks into him how much he would miss Jamie Fraser as his friend, as his da. He would miss him. And they just have a bond that I feel like doesn't get enough credit. And in book six, when Roger becomes a Presbyterian minister and Jamie is Catholic, he goes to Roger's first sermon. He stops a snake from ruining his sermon when Jamie is like terrified of snakes now. <laughs> and he just is always looking out for him. And even though he is a little harumph that he is a Presbyterian minister, <laughs> he is supportive of that. He believes in the good that a minister can do for the ridge and that people need someone to talk to about things and who to be there for. And it's not a lovey-dovey relationship by any means, but it's one of mutual respect and admiration, honestly. And I just feel like the show is only the teensiest bit starting to show that, and I feel like it's too little too late in some respects. I really wish we'd seen that part of Jamie's character where if you make good, he'll make good. And so when Roger chooses to come back, I feel like Jamie should have been more on his side than like anyone else was. Like I would have liked to see Jamie championing Roger and like giving him opportunities to shine. And if others said disparaging things that Jamie would back him up. That's what I wanted to see. Instead, we see Jamie cut him down again and again and again and again. And it takes until almost the end of the season for there to be anything. And I don't feel like it was a character arc we needed. We'd already had Roger like down in the dumps because the things they had him do in season five, he looked like a shithead a lot of times. Okay. We know it. And I think season five should have been about them winning Roger back to us. But as I've said, as I've cried, as I've lamented, the show doesn't care about Roger except for the fancy story where we get to tell a really cool like black and white picture of him getting his tracheotomy. Whew. Whew. So, there you be. That is all of the worst changes from the book to the show, in my opinion, and a couple of the ones that I liked. Tell me what yours are. Tell me which ones with mine you agree, which ones you don't, which things that I missed. 
I'm looking so forward to chat these with you. Don't forget, I have a special Outlander Discord server. You can join my Discord down below. This is a free app that you can get on either a computer or your phone or a tablet. And I have exclusive Outlander book spoilers and Outlander TV show spoilers in that channel where we can talk about this all the time. Thank you so much for watching. I put up new videos three to four times a week and you can watch some more of them right now.